Okay. I think we are all set. Yes, there we go. Excellent. All right. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome back to Storytime Saturdays. I am your narrator, Fragoth. And last week we left off on Chapter 5 of Giants on the Earth by Captain S.P. Meeks. And to recap the last couple things that had happened, um, our brave uh, plucky hero protagonists had just gone to Mars uh, with the purpose of acquiring Martian weaponry in order to have a revolt slash uprising against the Jovians who had uh, who have taken over Earth and run the show there. Um, as tyrannical despots. And the Jovians, incidentally, just kind of look like giant people. Uh, whereas the Martians look kind of like uh, giant caterpillars. Which I thought was cool. Um... However, upon acquiring the weapons from the Martians, they uh, get back to their spaceship, and the main character's wife, the lead protagonist's wife, uh, has been, or wife to be, fiance, has been kidnapped. And uh, I believe headed to Venus if memory serves. So the ultimatum basically is uh, the Martians will not allow our protagonist, who is a half-Jovian uh, human hybrid, to have the uh, Martian weapons if he goes to Venus. He can only use them in defense of Earth. So he can't go to save his beloved. He must uh, save Earth instead uh, for now. For now, until the uprising is complete slash successful. But then, then, all bets are off. I'm going to see if I can get the voices right again, uh, because this is two weeks later. <laughs> this is a week later, rather. And I can't remember half the voices I did. So I'm going to be faking it. Until I make it. All right. And without any further ado... This is Giants on the Earth by Captain S.P. Meeks. Chapter 5. A Desperate Plan. Flying the spaceship with a crew of two men instead of the normal nine threw a heavy strain on Damis. Turgen proved to be almost tireless, but while he could act as an observer, Damis devoutly hoped that no wandering celestial body would approach within the danger zone while he was alone on duty. Nothing of the sort happened. The days passed with monotonous slowness, yet daily and, indeed, hourly, the planet Mars faded to a red star, and the green point of light which marked their destination grew larger. Damis cast many a longing glance at Venus, but he remained steadfast to the faith which Turgon had engendered in him. During the long hours, Turgon had opportunity to tell the Nephthalim of some of the sacrifices made by terrestrials for the cause of liberty. They filled Damis with amazement and moved him to awe to think of the loyalty and bravery displayed by those whom he had been taught from childhood to regard as a race of slaves, created solely to minister to their overlords. Damis pushed the ship to the greatest acceleration which he dared to use, and, as they approached the Earth, he cast many an anxious glance at the diminishing fuel supply. For thirteen days he drove at high speed until the Earth seemed almost at hand. Using almost the full power of his bow motors, he checked its speed. 
For a time, he thought he had overestimated the power of his motors, and that it would be necessary to avoid the atmosphere belt, run past the earth, and return. At the middle of the fifteenth day, with the earth less than a thousand miles away, he threw in his last notch of power. The deceleration pressed them so tightly to the nose of the ship that they could hardly breathe. Damis lay with his hand on a side motor to throw them out of danger. Gradually, the forward motion of the ship ceased, and at last Damis rose with an effort and shut off the bow motors. We are falling under the influence of terrestrial gravity, he announced. In another three hours, we will land. He was as good as his word. Three hours later, he dropped the spaceship to a landing at a spot half a dozen miles distant from the beleaguered capital of the Sons of God. As he landed, the sun was just peeping over the eastern horizon. Their approach had been seen, and the ship was surrounded by hundreds of terrestrial swordsmen. As the airlock opened and Damis and Turgan appeared, there was silence for a moment, and then a thunderous thunderous shout of joy rose to the heavens. From the forefront of the crowd, a crimson-robed man ran toward the ship. "'Turgan, my lord!' he cried, as he fell on his knees and strove to kiss the Kildare's hand. "'You are spared to us who had given up, given you up for lost. Our spies reported that the sons of God had followed you to Mars.' Oh my goodness, what is this thing doing? Cat! It's the cat's fault! Had followed you to Mars and had slain you all. Havener reported to Glavor that you had made such a resistance that it was impossible to follow his orders and bring you back alive. Havener! cried Damis. Havener is on Venus with Lura! The ship of the Sons of God returned last night, replied the Akildare, with a loss of two men of its crew and with the Princess Lura a prisoner. Tears of joy sprang into Damis's eyes and ran unrestrained down his face. And is she safe? he cried. One of our spies saw her and reports that she is well, although in poor spirits. She is confined in the palace and will not be harmed. A Jovian fleet of a hundred ships is expected hourly with Tubane himself in command. A message to Glavor has ordered that Lura be held at Tubane, held for Tubane's arrival when he will dispose of her. What is the situation here, Tones? interrupted Turgan. I rejoice with Damis that my daughter is safe, yet, unless we are victorious, her present safety will avail her little. Things have gone neither well nor ill since your departure, Kildare, replied Tones. I have followed out the great conspiracy as it was planned many years ago. Although we have lost thousands of our bravest men, we have the sons of God besieged in the viceregal palace, and we have tapped out, tapped and cut the secret source of power which Timur, the Akildare, found years ago. They have no weapons, save some hand tubes that are not yet exhausted, and their axes. Their most powerful weapons of offense are crippled. Yet we cannot storm the palace in the face of the defenses they have left. Have you brought us any hope from Mars? We have brought weapons against which all the power and science of the sons of God are as helpless as is our feeble strength against their might replied Turgan. Send me men to transport these weapons, and in two hours not a Jovian will remain on the planet. A wild cheer of joy from the assembled terrestrials answered the words of the Kildare. A score of men ran forward and entered the spaceship on the heels of Turgan. They reappeared in a few minutes, carrying with the greatest of care the two terrible weapons, which were the gift of the Grand Mognac. Damis suddenly looked up from a reverie in which he had been plunged. "'I have just figured it out!' he exclaimed. "'Despite his report to Glavor, Havener knew that Turgan and I lived. 
He started away from Mars toward Venus, a destination which he had already informed his crew that they would make for. He feared the Martian weapons, and he strove to draw us away toward Venus, so that he would be safe. Once the Martian instruments had ceased to watch him, he altered his course, and made for Earth. With his greater supply of fuel and more powerful ship, he was able to make a higher speed and, despite the additional million or two of miles, he was able to land before us. The thing that puzzles me is why we were not seen by the Jovians as we approached. "'You came from a different direction than Havener, O oh Nephthalim,' replied Tonas. "'All of their instruments were either watching Havener or the Jovian fleet.' But for an accident, your approach would not have been noted by us. I am confident that the sons of God have no idea that you have returned, especially since Havener reported that he had slain you. We will take them by surprise. Where shall we take the weapons? Take the one with the blue rod to the top of the mountain which overlooks the palace. And, is, and set it so that the rod points in the direction from which Tubane's fleet is approaching. That hill is less than two miles from the palace, so you would better take them both there. Point the red rod toward the palace. At a word from Tones, the terrestrials started off with the weapons for the point indicated by Danis. The Nephthalim and Turgon followed, followed them, relating their adventure on the Red Planet as they walked along. The shutting off of the Jovian's source of power had effectually crippled all of the power-driven chariots which certain of the higher officials among the Earthmen had been allowed to maintain. On the top of the hill overlooking the palace grounds, the two Martian weapons were placed on the ground, side by side. Damis carefully aligned the red rod on the viceregal palace. When he had it set, with a word of warning, he closed the gravity anchor switch. The instrument settled a trifle on the solid rock on which it was bedded, and then was motionless. At a word from Damis, as many of the terrestrials as could find a hand rest pushed against it. It was as though they were pressing against the mountain itself. Damis sighted along the rod and adjusted it until it pointed at the center of the building. "'So much for that one,' he said. "'It is the less powerful of the two, but it will be enough to destroy the sons of God and the Nephthalim who are in the palace. The few who are scattered over the earth we can dispose of at our leisure. If the Jovian fleet approaches the earth from directly above us, we will be able to destroy it easily. In any event, this weapon is to be used only when it is approximately normal to the surface of the earth. We must have it almost under the point from which the Jovians are approaching. That may be on the opposite side of the earth. I think not, Nephilim. Nephilim, said Tonas. We know that Glavor and Tubane have been in constant communication since the Jovian fleet passed Mars, and he expects them to land here. There would be no object in their taking a circuitous route, so they will probably drop directly down in the palace grounds. Let us hope so, Tones. In any event, we might as well anchor the weapon here as elsewhere. He set the weapon with the blue rod on another patch of bare rock, and, nested the, and tested the rod to make sure that it revolved freely and could be made to cover the entire heavens from horizon to horizon. He closed the gravity anchor switch, and again the efforts of a dozen terrestrials were futile to move it. Now we are ready for their attack, he said to Turgon. You are as familiar with these weapons as I am, but I will instruct a dozen of your followers in using them. It is possible that we may not be able to operate the weapons ourselves. I can operate one weapon while you manipulate the other, Damis, replied the Kildare. However, no harm will be done in instructing others. I may not be here, said Damis briefly. Without replying to the questions of Turgon and Tones, he proceeded to instruct a dozen of the Earthmen in the use of the terrible Martian weapons. When he was certain that he had a half-dozen men capable of attending to each of the weapons, he turned to Turgon. I may not be here when the weapons are used, he said. 
When I thought that Lura had gone to Venus, I gave her up and sacrificed both her and my heart on the altar of our cause, for it is what she would have chosen. Now I have accomplished the sacrifice and returned with the Martian weapons to find that she is a captive in the Viceroy's palace. We can turn on the rays and reduce the building and all in it to a pinch of dust in a few seconds, but Lura would be immolated with the sons of God. The weapons are here, our men know how to use them, and my usefulness is at an end. Now I stand here with no more responsibility for our success than the humblest swordsman. Since I am no longer needed, I will leave the fate of the earth to you and follow out my private designs. "'Where are you going, Nephthalim? cried Tonas. The question was echoed by all within the sound of his voice. Only Turgon smiled as though he knew Damis's answer. "'Where could I go, Akildare, but to one place?' replied the Nephthalim. I go to Glavour's palace. I have two errands there. One is to rescue Lura, and the other is to meet out to Glavour the death which I swore that I would accomplish. The rays can be turned on, and the palace demolished at any time. But I ask that you wait until I return with Lura, or until you know that we are dead. But if the Jovian fleet arrives before that time, Nephthalim? demanded Tonas. Then give the word for the use of the weapons, Akildare, and Lura's soul and mine will join the thousands of others whose lives are but a part of the price the race of Earthmen have had to pay to rid their planet of the sons of God. It grieves me, Damis, to see you go to certain death, said Turgon sadly to the blonde giant, yet I will say nothing to stop you. Were it not that my presence would hinder you in your attempt, I would accompany you. Your place, Kildare, is at the head of your men, whom you were born to rule. I can hope to succeed only by stealth, else a thousand men would come with me. Now call from the ranks one who is a barber, that he may change the color of my hair, and alter my face, that I shall not be known. At the Kildare's word, three men stepped forward from the ranks of swordsmen and announced themselves adepts in the art of disguise. Swift runners were sent to bring supplies, and the three labored over Damis. When they had finished their ministrations, only a close observer would have known him under the bushy black beard which covered his face. Chapter 6 In the Seraglio With a parting word to Turgon and his followers, Damis made his way down the hill and into the thick tropical jungle which grew up almost to the gates of the Viceregal Palace. He was well acquainted with a secret entrance into the building. It was a matter of minutes for him to locate the outer end and open it. For half a mile he had made his way underground until a huge stone door barred his way. He felt for the hidden catches, and the slab of rock rose before him. As he turned toward the doorway, he found himself looking into the muzzle of a black ray tube in the hands of a gigantic Jovian in the uniform of the Viceroy's guards. "'Whence came you, Nephthalim?' demanded the guard, a cold note of suspicion in his voice. "'From far Torna,' replied Damis readily. "'I am Dermino, Comar of the province of the Capris. "'The slaves rose on us, and all were slain except me. "'I have had to travel by night and hide by day to reach here. "'I knew not whether the slaves had conquered or not.' But when I found them lying by thousands about Glavor's palace, I knew that the reign of the sons of God was safe. What news from Tubane? The face of the Jovian guard cleared as Damis spoke. Dermino, a son of Glavor by one of his terrestrial concubines, was Comar of Capris, a fact well known to Damis. There was nothing in the newcomer's story to excite suspicion. The fleet of the ruler of the universe is approaching, the guard replied. In two hours it will be hovering above us. 
We would have needed no aid had not the dogs of Earthmen found our source of power and managed to destroy it with stolen ray tubes. We have been cooped up here like rats waiting for Tubane or to arrive. When he comes, our vengeance will be heavy. The heavier, the better, growled Damis with an oath. The dogs have been getting surly for a generation. I hope that Tubane will teach them a lesson that will not be forgotten for ages to come. He will never fear, laughed the guard. Already Glavor has made his plans. I am not a member of the council, yet I have heard enough to realize why Glavor is our ruler. My brain could not conceive of such a stupendous plan. I will go to my father now, said Damis. What is the word for passing the inner gate? I wish to surprise my sire, for he doubtless mourns me as dead. He thinks you are dead, replied the guard, yet I never heard of Glavor mourning for any loss which did not affect his pleasures. He has plenty of bastards to take your place. The word is to bane. I thank you, son of God, said Damis, and I will inform my sire of the great respect and high regard which you have for him. Fear not, your words shall be truthfully reported to him. Leaving the Jovian guard hastily reviewing the conversation with the supposed Dermino, Damis made his way toward the palace. Since he knew that he would not reach another door until after several of the underground passages with which the foundations of the palace were honeycombed had joined, he had little doubt of his ability to make his way unsuspected into the citadel. He debated for a moment on the advisability of killing the Jovian guard and taking his weapons, but caution prevailed, and empty-handed, save for a dagger concealed under his robes, he strode forward. His knowledge of the password enabled him to pass the various guards he met without difficulty. There were many of the Nephthalim who held subordinate positions in the outlying provinces, and who were seldom at court, and the Jovian guards, who in their hearts regarded the Nephthalim as little better than the terrestrials, paid small attention to him. He passed several guarded points before the path rose steeply, and he passed through the final gate into the palace itself. A Nephthalim passed him hurriedly, and Damis plucked at his robe. "'I am just from outpost,' he said. "'What news of Tubane?' "'The fleet has entered an atmosphere belt a thousand miles east of here,' replied the Nephthalim. "'They are dropping to an altitude of five miles, and then will approach. "'They should arrive in an hour. It is well that they hurry.' "'What rush is there?' asked Damis in surprise. "'We may not be able to leave here, but at the same time all the forces the slaves can muster would never force an entrance.' "'You have not heard, then?' exclaimed the other in surprise. "'No.' "'Certainly not, if you have been on outpost, for I just learned it myself. "'There is a rumor that Havener lied when he said he killed Turgon, the Kildare, and Damis, the renegade.' The curse of Tubane rest on him, on Mars. It is said that they not only escaped death, but have returned to Earth armed with the weapons of the Red Planet. Havener is with Glavour now, and no one knows what the outcome will be. Since Tubane is at hand, doubtless nothing will be done until he arrives. That is the reason why Tubane altered his course, and came down so far away instead of directly overhead. He hopes thus to elude the Martian weapons if the Earthmen really have them. Surely that is a lie, cried Damis. We hope that it is, yet Havena would have been slain without mercy had he admitted that he left Mars without slaying or capturing Turgon and Damis. Many believe that it is true. Is Lavour in the council room? asked Damis. I have a message. It would be better for you to defer the message, if it be ill news, until Tubane arrives, brother, for Glavour is enraged beyond measure at all of us. He threatens to sacrifice us at the next games, and he may do so unless Tubane alters the decree. He has not loved us since Damis broke his arm a month ago. Nevertheless, I will deliver my message, replied Damis. While it may not please him, it is essential that he get it before Tubane arrives. Good luck go with you, brother, replied the Nephthalim with a shrug of his shoulders. The temper of the Viceroy of God is an uncertain quality at best. 
He is in his seraglio. Damis saluted the messenger, and made his way toward the inner portion of the palace where the women whom the lustful viceroy had dragged into his harem were kept. He had no plausible excuse for passing the guards into this forbidden portion of the palace, but that was a matter which caused him small worry. There were few of the secrets of the palace which were not well known to Damis, who had at one time been major-domo of the building. There were some well known to him, the existence of which was not even suspected by the majority of the sons of God. As he neared the seraglio, he turned off to his right, and passed through a maze of little-used passages, until he halted before what was apparently a blank wall, casting a rapid glance around to ensure himself that there was no one in sight, he touched a hidden catch, and a portion of the wall swung inward, opening a way before him. He entered a passage built in the thickness of the wall and lighted with radium bulbs. The door closed softly behind him. He removed his sandals, lest even their quiet tread should betray him, and on bare feet crept forward. The passage bent and twisted as it followed the walls until Damis knew that he was in one of the walls of the seraglio. Praying that it would work noiselessly, he slid open a panel of stone and found himself looking through a semi-transparent hanging into the sacred precincts of the seraglio itself. Clavour stood facing him, his heavy face drawn up in a scowl of rage. Damis noted with satisfaction that one of the viceroy's arms was supported by a silk scarf, and that he made no attempt to use it. With a pale face, Havener stood before his ruler. "'The word has been brought to me from a source which I trust as much as I do your own word, Havener,' Glavour was saying. "'I tell you, I do not believe your story.' If Damis and Turgon were dead, the terrestrials would not see them alive again on earth. Neither would they have weapons of which we know nothing. One of our observers admits that he saw a spaceship land a few hours ago, coming from the direction of Mars. You failed in your mission, Havener, and I am, and on you I pronounce the doom. I sentence you to the twilight of the gods. "'I appeal to to Bane from that sentence,' cried the equerry with dry lips. "'Your appeal shall be noted and laid before him at the proper time,' replied the viceroy savagely. "'Yet, by the time he arrives, it will be too late. Ho, guards, take him away!' Havener turned as though to resist, but six of the huge Jovians answered the viceroy's call. Two of them grasped him by the arms and started to lead him from the room. "'I appeal!' cried Havener again. "'I brought back the maiden whom I was sent to fetch, and for that reason I made no failure. To bring her was the principal item of my orders.' Glavour's face grew purple with rage. "'And who sent the message to Tubain which resulted in the orders which he sent me?' he demanded savagely. It was sent by one of your henchmen, and by your orders. You slew the sender before I could question him, but I know whose orders he obeyed. Take him away! The guards started to drag the luckless equerry from the presence of the viceroy, but Havener made a final appeal for his life. "'I will confess, Viceroy of God!' he cried. "'No message was sent to Tubain. "'I dared not send such a message, "'lest such orders would be returned, "'as I caused to be given to you. "'I coveted the maiden for myself, "'and I took this means of getting her. "'I had a false message delivered to you "'which would prevent you from taking her "'before Tubain arrived. "'In reward for my services as spy on you, "'I plan to ask that she be given to me.' I surrender all claims to her, Glavour. Spare my life, and you may have her. For a moment, Glavour could not speak for rage. So you have been the spy who has reported my every doing and my every secret counsel to Tubain, he gasped. 
But for you, I would long ago have conquered Venus and Mercury, and declared myself independent of the Jovian overlord. In time, I might even have overthrown him, but every move was known to him before I made it. Not once, but a dozen times would you go through the twilight, were to Bane not at hand. Niton, it is my order that the twilight be as slow as our instruments will allow. Give him time to learn, to suffer, and to pray for the blessing of death at my hand. Take him away. The struggling Havener was removed by the guards, despite his efforts at resistance and his cries for mercy. Glavour stared after him for a moment, and an evil gleam, gleam came into his eyes. Sonom, he called sharply. A guard entered the room and saluted. "'Sonam, bring me the daughter of man, Lura!' cried the viceroy. "'When you have brought her here, post guards at all doors, and see that no one is admitted under any circumstances, until Tubane himself arrives and demands admittance.' The guard hesitated. Uh, "'Your Excellency,' he faltered, "'the orders from Tubane were—' False rumors given out by the traitor, Havener, who has now gone to the twilight of the gods, interrupted the viceroy. By the crown of Tubane, do I need to repeat my orders? I am viceroy of the earth, and am supreme until Tubane revokes my rank. Obey my orders! The guard saluted and withdrew. Lavour licked his thick lips in anticipation and strode restlessly back and forth across the room. Inside the hangings, Damis's face hardened and he drew his dagger from under his robe. The door opened, and Sonam returned, dragging Lura after him. The face of the earth girl was pale and drawn, yet when, he saw, when she saw Glavour, her head rose in an expression of defiance. Sonam saluted the viceroy and left the room, the massive door clanging shut behind him. Glavour stared at the girl with an evil leer on his heavy countenance. "'I have learned, daughter of man,' he said slowly, "'of how you seduced one of my servants from his duty to me, and caused him to forge an order from the great Tubane in order that he might keep you for his own pleasure.' For a time the stratagem succeeded, but now my eyes are open. When I first looked upon your face and form, I swore to myself that you should be the solace of my leisure hours. Now the time is come. I was minded once to honor you as Hortan once honored a terrestrial, and let you amuse yourself by sitting on a throne. But your treachery has changed my intention. Not even as an accepted concubine shall you rank, but only as a slave to be used as a toy and tossed to one of my guards when I am tired of you. Come hither. Lura made no move to obey the order, and Glavour, with an oath, stepped toward her, his one good arm outstretched in a grasping gesture. Lura did not move until his hand almost closed on her arm, and then she sprang back. Her hand sought the bosom of her robe, and the viceroy recoiled as a glittering dagger flashed in the air. "'Back, Jovian!' cried Lura in ringing tones. "'Think you that the daughter of a king of men is to be a toy for your base Jovian passions? The point of this dagger is poisoned, so that one touch through your skin will mean death. One step nearer, and I will strike!' The viceroy hesitated for a moment and then drew from his robe a short, thick tube. Lura correctly interpreted the gesture. "'Raise that tube, and I will bury the blade in my own body,' she cried. "'I know that you have the power to clasp me in your arms, but it will be a corpse which you clasp.' She lowered the knife until the point rested against the skin of her throat. The slightest pressure would cause it to penetrate her skin and bring about her almost instant death." Glavour watched her like a cat, the tube ready in his hand. With a grim laugh, he threw the tube from him and walked a few steps away. Lura lowered the knife. 
As she did so, Glavour turned with a movement so swift that the eye could hardly follow it. His eyes caught Lura's, and she straightened back her head, powerless against his will, caught as she was, momentarily off her guard. "'Throw down your knife!' said Glavour's voice slowly. Lura struggled to raise the weapon against herself, but she could not. Slowly her fingers relaxed, and the weapon clattered on the floor. Still holding her eyes with his own, Glavour stepped forward until his huge, splayed foot rested on the weapon. He averted his gaze and swiftly picked it up. Lura gave a scream of horror and strove to fly, but the heavy door was barred against her. Glavour placed the weapon in a cabinet on the wall, which he locked, and then turned to her, an expression of triumph on his face. "'It is useless, daughter of man, to struggle against the will of the sons of God,' he said mockingly. "'What we desire is ours. Come to me.' Lura's face showed an expression of loathing as she looked at the huge, misshapen monstrosity before her. The viceroy forgot the momentary satisfaction of his triumph in his rage at her attitude. With a growl of anger, he grasped at her. Lura evaded, avoided the rush and ran along the side of the room, Glavour in pursuit. He cornered her at last, and she stopped with her back to the tapestry with, with which the room was hung. Glowering in his triumph, Glavour approached and reached out his hand to seize her. His huge paw descended, but before it touched her shoulder, a hand with fingers of steel reached through the hangings and grasped his wrist. When Sonam had dragged Lura into the room, Damis inserted the point of his dagger into the tapestry and started to cut a slit through which he could enter the room. The keen-edged knife cut for a few inches readily enough and then stopped. Damis withdrew the blade and examined the stuff before him. An expression of dismay crossed his face, for the material was crisscrossed with stellanium wires set six inches apart. Each juncture was brazed together and the hole made a web through which he could not force his way. Cautiously, he exerted his strength. The keen blade hewed through the first of the stellanium strands, but Damis held his breath as the wire parted. It seemed impossible that the, thi that the ting of parting metal, which sounded like a thunderclap in his ears, would not be heard by the viceroy. He knew that there must be an entrance into the room through the hangings, and he made his way cautiously forward testing the draperies from time to time with his knife. When Lura laid her dagger against her breast and threatened to end her life, it took all of Damis's self-control to keep from crying out and striving to force his way into the room by sheer strength. He knew the toughness of Stellanium well enough to realize the impossibility of even his enormous strength tearing apart a webbing of it. Cer uh, the certainty that Glavour would not push matters far enough to rob himself of his prey aided him to restrain his ardor and pursue his systematic search. He came at last to a corner where his knife met with no resistance as it made its way through the silken stuff on the walls. Swiftly, he cut a slit through which he could rush. As he parted the material, Lura rushed past him and stood with her back to the wall to await the oncoming viceroy. Damis raised his hand and stood ready. As Glavor's huge paw descended on Lura's shoulder, Damis's hand shot out. Still holding the wrist of the viceroy in a grip of steel, he emerged from his hiding place, tearing off the black wig and beard which disguised him. Damis! cried Lura in wonder and delight as she saw him. Glavour stared with unbelieving eyes for a moment, and then a hoarse cry of alarm burst from his lips. Desperately he strove to release his wrist from the Nephthalim's grip, but to no avail. He disengaged his crippled arm from the scarf, which supported it, and groped under his robe for a weapon. Lura cried out in warning, but Damis had anticipated such a move. With a quick effort, he whirled about and drew the viceroy's arm over his shoulder. 
he bent forward and exerted his full strength. The huge bulk of Glavor rose in the air and pitched forward over Damis's shoulder. There was a crash as he landed on the marble floor. Quick as a cat, Damis sprang on him and pinioned down his arms. Take his weapons, Lura, he cried. Lura bent over the prostrate form of the Jovian to take from his belt the tubes which he habitually carried there. As she stooped, Glavour raised one of his huge feet and struck her with all the force of his mighty thighs behind the blow. With a cry of pain, Lura flew halfway across the room. Damis leaped to her assistance, forgetting for a moment the potentialities for destruction which the Viceroy bore on his person. A sudden sound made him whirl about. He bent over Lura and picked her from the floor. With her in his arms? He leapt to one side, just as a flash of violet light stabbed through the air. It missed them by inches. He dropped Lura on a rug and turned to face Glavour. On the Jovian's face was an expression of fiendish triumph. In his hand was a short black tube which he aimed with deliberate slowness at the crouching Nephthalim. Damis shifted his gaze from the Viceroy's eyes and concentrated it on the muscles of his wrist. Glavor's grip tightened and Damis leapt to one side as the violent light again stabbed the air. With an oath, Glavor swung the deadly ray in an arc to trying to reach the Nephthalim, but Damis moved like a cat. Once, as the ray almost touched him, he sprang high in the air and let it sweep by under him. With each movement he came nearer to the Viceroy. Slowly, the violet began to lose its intensity of color. Glavor dropped it and reached. Ooh, excuse me. Dropped it and reached for a second tube. Before he could draw one, Damis was on him. Chapter 7 The Deluge Few of the Sons of God and none of the Nephthalim, save Damis, could match the brute strength of the Viceroy. As Damis rushed, Glavor sidestepped and caught the Nephthalim's arm in a bone-crushing grasp. Damis made no effort to break the grip, but with his free hand he gripped the wrist of, the Glavor's, of Glavor's crippled arm. With a quick effort, he twisted it, and the Viceroy gave a shriek of pain as the newly knit bone gave way, and his arm fell, dangling and useless. Damis caught his sound arm in a powerful grip and twisted slowly on the wrist. Gradually, Glavor's fingers relaxed, and Damis's arm was free. His hands shot up and gripped Glavor about the throat, just in time to shut off the cry for help which was forming on his thick lips. The two giants strove silently for mastery in the struggle which meant life for the victor and death for the vanquished. The expression in Damis's eyes was one of confident mastery, but the face of the Jovian showed something that was strangely akin to fear. Even when he was whole, Glavor had found that his strength was no match for the power that lay in Damis's graceful limbs. With one of the Viceroy's arms useless, the issue was a foregone conclusion. Glavor's face gradually grew purple, and his eyes started out of their sockets. His tongue protruded horribly from his opened jaws. He grew weaker until it was only Damis's grip which kept him from falling to the ground. Then Damis broke his silence and spoke slowly and distinctly into the dying Viceroy's ears. "'I was loyal to you, Glavor,' he said, "'despite your brutality and sensuality which sickened me, "'until you strove to add to your already crowded seraglio "'the maiden whom I had chosen. "'As a Nephthalim, you thought I had no right which you need respect, "'and I would tamely submit to whatever you chose to do.' You forgot that in my veins run the best of earth and the proudest blood of Jupiter. Hortan was a mildash of Jupiter, a rank to which you could never aspire. I restricted your efforts and proved to you a thing which I long have known, that, man to man, I am your superior. Even then, you might have won back my loyalty had I not learned... 
how my father and my mother came to their death. It has always been given out that they went to Jupiter on a summons from Tubain, but I know the truth. They died under the knife of a cowardly assassin, under your knife, Glavor. Then it was that I swore that it would be my hand that would strike you down. When you raised your hand against me, you were Viceroy of the Earth, and your power was secure, for the conspiracy against you had no hope of success. What is the situation now? You are beleaguered in your palace, holding only the ground your few feeble weapons cover. Even this ground you hold only on the sufferance of the Earthmen. Listen to what I say, for why wish your last moments to be bitter ones? On the hill east of the city sit two weapons of a type and a power unknown to both Earth and Jupiter. They are the deadly black ray weapons of Mars. Ah, you tremble. You have good cause. One of them is trained on this palace, while the other searches the heavens, ready to blast into powder the fleet of Tubane when it appears. And who, think you, brought this about, Glavor? It was I, Damis, the Nephthalim, the half-breed bastard whom you despised. My only regret is that I cannot send you to the twilight of the gods as you sent that other arch-traitor, Havener. Are your last moments pleasant, Glavor? I am increasing the pressure slowly so that you will have time to think, to think of the earthmen you have given to sacrifice and torture, to think of your ruler, Hortan, dying under your knife, to think of the doom which is about to overcome your race. Think, Glavor, for your time for thought is short. As he finished, Damis thrust back on the Viceroy's chin with a sudden effort. There was a dull crack as Glavor's neck broke, and Damis gently lowered the inert bulk to the floor. He felt a touch on his arm as he straightened up. He whirled like a cat, and Lura shrank back with a frightened gesture. Damis opened his arms, and in an instant the earth girl was folded in them. "'Is my father safe?' was her first question. "'Safer by far than we are!' exclaimed Damis with a sudden pang of anxiety. He glanced at the time-recording device on the wall. Three quarters of an hour had passed since he had first entered the viceregal palace. If the estimates of Tubain's arrival, which he had heard, were correct, the Jovian fleet should be almost over... overhead. "'Come!' he cried to Lura. "'We have no time to lose if we escape before the palace and all in it are destroyed. "'Where did Havener lead, land his ship?' "'In the yard west of the palace,' she replied. "'Pray that it is still there,' said Damis. "'We can reach it through the path by which I entered this room. "'Come quickly.' "'With Lura at his heels, he passed through the rent in the tapestry "'and entered the secret passage through the walls.' The way twisted and turned interminably, but finally he paused before a door. Before opening it, he slid back a panel which opened a peephole and looked out. "'The ship is there,' he whispered in a voice of relief. "'There is only one guard over it that I can see. Why didn't I think to bring Glavour's weapons? I'll have to try to catch him by surprise. When I open the door, run straight for the spaceship as though you were trying to escape from me.' Don't try to dodge the guard. Keep right on for the ship. As soon as I overpower the guard, get in the ship and hold your hand on the starting lever. When I get aboard, throw in the power at a low rate. We don't want to rise rapidly enough to get out of easy control. Do you understand? Yes, Damis, she whispered. He watched until a sudden shout drew the attention of the sentry momentarily away from the ship he was guarding. A confused sound of cheering came from the palace, and the sentry looked toward the western heavens. A moment of gazing, and he raised his voice in a raucous shout of joy. Instantly, Damis swung open the door. Lura sped out like a frightened deer, with Damis in close pursuit. The attention of the sentry was fixed on some distant object in the sky, and he did not see the oncoming pair until Lura was only a few yards from him. The sound of her footsteps attracted his attention and he glanced down at her. An expression of surprise came over his heavy features, and he reached for a weapon. 
His gesture was never finished, for Damis's fist caught him under the ear and he dropped in his tracks. Damis looked in the direction in which the sentry had been staring, and a cry broke from his lips. The fleet of Tubane, he cried. A thousand yards in the air, and a scant five miles to the west, was a clump of a half-dozen Jovian space flyers. Massed behind them were a hundred more. They were approaching with tremendous velocity. Damis gave a mighty bound and leaped through the airlock of the ship. Hardly had he cleared the door than Lura pulled down the starting lever. The ship flew up from the ground. Hardly had it left its ways than a momentary flash came from the hill east of the palace. The air grew black around them, and a cold, and a cold as of interstellar space penetrated their very bones. In an instant the ship had flashed up into the sun above the zone of influence of the Martian weapon. The shouting from the palace was suddenly stilled. Damis looked down, but nothing could be seen save of a pall of intense blackness over the ground where the building stood. "'The port motor, Lura!' cried Damis. The Jovian fleet was approaching so rapidly that a collision with the nearest flyer seemed inevitable. There was a roar from the air as Lura threw in the port blast with its maximum power. Damis was hurled against the side of the ship. From the hill where the Martian weapons had been placed came a second flash of light, and a beam of jetty blackness shot through the air. An edge of it brushed the ship for an instant, and Lura stiffened. A terrible cold bit through the flyer, and the side where the Martian ray had touched crumpled into powder. The ship sped on, and the friction of the air and the bright rays of the sun dissipated the extreme cold. Through the terrific storm which was raging, the black ray stabbed again and again. Back and forth it played, and ship after ship of the Jovians was momentarily caught in the beam. When the beam passed on, there was nothing left of the ship save a cloud of dust which the terrific wind dissipated in all directions. Damis glanced at the earth below him. It seemed to be flying past the ship at a velocity which he could hardly comprehend. He made his way against the pressure of the movement to the control levers and strove to check the speed. As the earth ceased to revolve beneath them, the wind rose to a terrible force. "'What has happened, Damis?' shrieked Lura in his ear. "'I don't know,' he shouted in reply. "'I am trying to keep away from the neighborhood of the palace for a while until the Jovian fleet is destroyed.' Tones and your father might not be able to tell us from one of Tubane's ships, and they might turn the ray on us. He bent over the control levers of the ship, but they refused to obey his touch. The stern motor still roared with enough force to keep them three thousand feet above the ground, but none of the side motors responded to the controls. The ship was helpless and tossed about, a plaything of the terrific wind which howled through the heavens. Damis watched the ground below them. Look, Lura, he cried. They swept over the site of the palace. The black ray was no longer playing on it, but the whole palace glistened like crystal. What is it? she asked. Frost, he shouted. The Martian weapon did its work well. Everything in that palace is frozen. In the name of Tubane! The Jovian ejaculation had burst from his lips, unbidden, at the sight of which met his gaze. Racing over the land was a solid wall of water, hundreds of feet high and moving with enormous speed. On toward the palace it swept. Below they could see the earthmen on the hill striving to fly, but there was no place of safety. The oncoming wall of water was higher by a hundred feet than the top of the hill, and it was the highest bit of land for many miles. Nearer and nearer came the water, until with a roar and a crash, which they could plainly hear in the crippled spaceship, it swept over the hill, and the palace, burying them under a hundred feet of brine. "'Father!' cried Lura in anguish. Damis made his way across the ship and folded her in his arms. "'He was chosen as one of the lives needed to buy the freedom of the earth,' he murmured to her. 
It is hard, for I loved him as a father, but it was the end which he would have chosen. He died at the head of his followers, battling for freedom. What happened, Damis? asked Lura an hour later as she looked down on the seething tumult of water under them. As nearly as I can figure out, the Jovian fleet approached the palace from the west at a low elevation. In order to destroy them, we could not use the Martian weapon normal to the Earth's surface as they commanded us, but were forced to use it tangentially. The enormous counter-reaction to the stream of force of almost incredible intensity, which was shot at Tubane's flyers, had to be absorbed in some way. The weapon could not take it up as it was anchored to the center of gravity of the Earth. As a result, the force was translated into one of increased rotation. The Earth must be spinning on its axis at fully twice its former rate. Both the air and the water had too much inertia to follow the accelerated motion of the land, so the wind blew a gale and the oceans left their beds and swept over the land. Everything must have been swept to destruction before this flood. And all our labor and sacrifice has been useless, cried Lura. We have freed a world at the cost of the lives of its inhabitants. The world is not lost, sweetheart, he cried as he clasped her to him. The floods will not have overwhelmed the mountains, and some men and animals will have escaped. The waters will subside in a few weeks, as they take up the new rotation of the earth. By his will we are spared for the labor of building a new world. As soon as the land again appears above the waters, we will land and assemble those who have been spared. The fleet of Jupiter has been destroyed, and we need fear no fresh attack for ages, perhaps never. Unhampered, we will build a new world, and try to avoid the mistakes of the old one. Look, Damis, exclaimed Lura in a hushed tone. From the spray and mist below them leaped a living bridge of colored light. Above the sun it arced its way into the heavens, in the direction of which they knew Mars lay. "'It is his promise,' whispered Damis reverently, "'that henceforth the planets will live in peace and amity, that never more, and am, in peace and amity, and that never more will the Jovians be allowed to invade us.'" The End And that was Giants on the Earth by Captain S. P. Meek. Good stuff. I am sorry that it took two sessions to get through. I gravely misjudged how long it was. Let's see. And another short one I wanted to do after this. Here we go. Here we go. And next up, this is a short but cute, short but good one. The Long Silvery Day by Magnus Ludens from Galaxy Magazine of April 1962. So not quite as old as that last one, which was from the 30s, uh, which you could probably tell by the way some of the sentences were structured. Um, they wrote differently back then. Um, yeah, that last one reminded me fondly of uh, the Lensman series, which, incidentally, I recommend to absolutely anyone. Lensman. Oh my gosh, the entire Lensman series is a blast. That, that series is just nuts. It can be a little dry sometimes, simply because the writing style is, is uh, I guess from a modern perspective, rather outdated, but it's just zany zany craziness 
All right. The Long Silvery Day by Magnus Ludens. It was one of those days, perhaps you've had them, when everything went right. Let's go slumming, said Flowers, said Powers of Pearl. Let's give an Earthman his wish for a day. We haven't played that game in ages. How do we pick him? Firepride asked indulgently. Phone book? Intensity's more fun. But no more nomads. I got so bored putting connoisseur features on synthetic camels. Peter Stone put on his hat and started for the station. Every third step he inhaled and told himself, It isn't that bad. Peter had a good job, a good wife, and commuting was wearing him down to a twitch. Sooty, teeth-rattling rain, Penn Station steaming caverns, a soggy, lurching bus, lunch down in sun-seared, exhaust-ventilated streets, and the ride home. As the hated maroon dot of his train appeared, a convulsion of revulsion shook him. I wish it weren't that bad, he thought with every fiber, and powers of pearl suffused with the glow of challenge, laughed. Peter Stone, fighting at the newsstand, noted with annoyance that a crew of maintenance men swarmed about the train. Broke down again, he thought bitterly. Halfway down his car, two men ran a vacuum cleaner over the tired plush. Keeping pace behind them, two others aimed wide-mouthed silver hoses upwards, spreading thick sheets of foam on the ceiling. It wasn't until Peter Stone unfolded his newspaper that he noticed how quiet had spread with that foam. Next, his ears registered with surprise the purr of freshly oiled machinery, and his eyes the sight of a tree, for once without its double window screen of hair oil and dried grime droplets. When he boarded his bus, a maintenance man was just hanging a sign over the gagged fare box. Due to tax readjustment, urban transportation fee. The driver, liberated from change-making and police duties, smiled a greeting at him. No crush in the bus, perhaps because there seemed so many about. The silver one coming towards him had a big green and white sign. Down 5th to 33rd, west on 33rd to 7th, Penn Station last stop. It was the first readable bus sign he remembered seeing. Whenever the light turned red, he found, squads of maintenance men darted about the stopped cars and trucks, slapping silver cylinders over each exhaust pipe. He could hear snatches of explanations. City ordinance. Free service. As soon as a cylinder was in place, smoke and noise stopped coming out of the exhaust. When his hat sailed gaily towards the hook, Peter Stone realized that, incredibly, he wasn't tired. Work flowed through his fingers. His secretary smiled, his boss looked in once and whistled. At noon, only the thought of paraffined carton coffee restrained him from staying in. "'Coming right up, seventeen, said the new silver grill next to the elevator button. Cheered, he clove the mindless rush downstairs and pushed, against, and pushed inside a luncheonette, where maintenance men were finishing the removal of every second stool and the reupholstery of the remainder with foam cushions. A smiling waitress brought him a menu and a pencil. Opposite each item was a small circle, and a line at the top explained, This is your menu check. Please mark wanted items. Drop menu check in slot. Served incredibly fast, Peter Stone ate in blissful peace. On his way out, he saw that the cashier's cage had been replaced with three silver cabinets with hoppers for menu checks and money, recessed cups for change and a turnstile each. When he walked through, he found that he still had forty minutes of his lunch hour left. Forty minutes! He could walk to a bookshop, or the park. Walk through exhaust fumes and the belches of air conditioner waste? But silver mesh covered the noisome vents. A cautious sniff assured him it worked. He decided to walk to the library newsstands for a foreign magazine. As he reached 42nd and 5th, an army of workmen were putting up the last touches on a structure of dull silver that spanned the four sides of the intersection. Airy and elegant, with faint echoes of library style, the quadruple arch provided the perfect finishing touch for the square. Each side was composed of three escalators and moving platforms in both directions, 
with a set of stairs and a promenade. Promenade? Timidly, he set foot on the silver filigree. He was wafted up, across and down. Beneath him flowed a brilliant river of quiet cars. Fascinated, he took the trip back, then stood on the promenade, watching the pattern, breathing in incredulous lungfuls of clean air. The afternoon fled on newly silent feet. Once more he put on his hat to face the ride home. His small, air-conditioned silver bus reached Penn Station ten minutes earlier than usual. By now, Peter Stone was not overly surprised to see silver moving ways disappearing into the station's maw, nor, once inside, to feel breezes that blew silently from silver gadgets like jet engines. He also accepted the waiting passengers dancing in the great lobby. The piped music there had long been excellent. A low, pleasant voice announced his train in diamond-cut syllables that floated from silver dollar speakers spangling in the walls. Silver escalators swept to a bright platform covered in springy, non-skid green plastic. One wall of his train was made up of clear plastic sliding doors. Inside there were deep pile carpets, reclining chairs, low blue overheads, and movable reading lights. As the doors slid softly shut, Peter Stone remembered, as usual, the letter he'd forgotten to mail for his wife. But this time he could see a stamp machine and mailbox at the end of the car. When he got up, he saw that there were also milk, coffee, soda, fruit, cigarette, aspirin, and newspaper vending machines, and three telephone booths. The train glided to a hushed halt three minutes after a speaker at his elbow had murmured the name of his station. Before his wife's goggling eyes, Peter Stone bounded down the steps and ran to their car. She remembered that evening for the rest of her life. Powers of Pearl let the silver evaporate, and with it the memory of it. The best game yet, she smiled, leaning in happy exhaustion against Firepride's shoulder. You were magnificent, laughed Firepride. One step ahead of an entire city. Powers of Pearl blushed radiantly. No trace of their game remained. But for some obscure reason, Peter Stone decided that one day he would run for mayor. And that was The Long Silvery Day by Magnus Ludens. That was a cute one. I like, I like stories like that. Sweet little things. All right, I actually have to make a break for it early today, um, much to my chagrin, as well as yours, I'm sure. All of my dedicated listeners, whoever you may be, um, thanks for tuning in. I will be here next week, I think, unless something dramatic pops up that I'm not aware of, in which case I will try to uh, make it known that I'm not going to have it. Um Thanks for tuning in. I do have my uh, Mecha Monday and Warframe Wednesday streams coming up um, on Monday and Wednesday, respectively. Um, feel free to tune into those. It's at the same time. Uh, all right. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day.